Let's ask the Lord to bless our time in His Word together. Father, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and we're grateful for the privilege of having the freedom to worship. We recognize there are brothers and sisters in Christ in various places in our world who would love to have the freedoms that we have. And <clears throat> as we, uh, we may chafe a bit under the restrictions from the government because of COVID-19, but it's nothing to be compared with what uh, others are enduring, even persecution, and imprisonment, and some martyrdom because of the name of Jesus that they profess. So, Lord, we ask for your blessing uh, upon those who are enduring persecution for your name's sake. We know that uh, the Lord Jesus promised that there was a, a blessing for those who endure such, but still for those who are in those situations today, we pray for a real strong sense of your presence and blessing in their lives, as well as in our own, as we open your word together. Uh, for those who are not able to gather with us, but are joining us online, we pray for your blessing upon them as well. And Lord, I ask that you would help me to communicate clearly the truths from your word today. May you be our teacher, we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> so it was a year ago, yesterday, that I changed job descriptions. Uh, Lori and I joined Life of Messiah back when it was still American Messianic Fellowship, and that was the name under which your church began supporting us. That was back in 1975 that we joined, and then I uh, was field missionary for 15 years, and then was privileged for uh, almost 30 complete years to be the executive director. And last year, the board found my replacement at my request, and uh, I'm still full-time with Life and Messiah, but I have a new title of a Global Ambassador. And with COVID-19, I almost feel like I need to take the global off because all of my overseas travels have been postponed since, uh, since February. And in fact, in just two weeks, I'm supposed to be up in Toronto for a Chinese church's camp. They have a spiritual life emphasis for a week. And one of the greatest pressure points I'm under right now, and I really appreciate your prayers, is that since I can't be there in person, they want me to videotape these messages. Now let me tell you how this worked. I've spoken at this church probably ten times or more already, and they're wonderful folks. Uh, but when I speak, because many of the folks are from Hong Kong, it's a Cantonese-speaking congregation, now, the younger generation, some of those kids don't know Cantonese very well. English is their first language. Many of them are bilingual. So when I, if I were preaching in English, of course they understand. And did I have the capability to preach in Cantonese? They wouldn't need a translator, but the kids would need a translator because they don't understand Cantonese. And some of the older folks don't really know English very well at all. So there's a necessity for translation. So when they told me that I had four times to speak for this series, uh, and that the messages were, were 90 minutes, I thought, well, that's 45 minutes for me and 45 minutes for the translator. So I began my preparations with that. But in later communication, I found out, no, they wanted me to preach for 90 minutes, and the translator also <laughs> has 90 minutes. And I'm thinking, these poor folks who are going to be uh, subjected to a talking head on a video for, for 90 minutes. And Randy requested that I not preach the 90 minute message this morning. So, so you can be grateful to him for, for uh, his mercy upon you. But the theme for that conference is prepare to meet your God from Amos chapter 4 verse 13. And it's not a passage that I've ever preached on before. But I've really given a lot of thought to uh, prepare to meet your God. When I was a kid growing up in New England, sometimes when we'd be out on a road trip, whether in our own home state of Massachusetts and then Connecticut, uh, or as we traveled throughout the country, my dad loved to take us places on vacation. It was not unusual to see the signboard, prepare to meet thy God. Have you seen, seen those? And sometimes in cartoons you'll see uh, somebody with a signboard, you know, prepare to meet your God. But the full verse is hardly ever quoted. It's prepare to meet your God, O Israel. That's who the audience was, of course, that Amos was sent to, uh, to the northern tribes. Well, I'm not going to preach for Amos this morning. I've been thinking a lot about what would it be like to meet God. You know, we talk about God all the time. We pray to God. Uh, those of us who grew up in the church, you know, we know a lot about God. But thinking about actually being in His presence. Uh, 
for believers, we think about that with joy. And there was just a funeral here yesterday that Randy and Becky attended, and it was the funeral of a believer. And you know, I've preached a number of funerals, and most of them have been for believers, but on occasion I've preached for a funeral for someone who we weren't certain was a believer or pretty afraid that they were not a believer. And believe me, there's a difference in the way in which uh, you can approach the message. Because when it's someone who is a believer, then, you know, our sorrow is for us because we miss the person. But we're not, we're not sorrowful at all for the person who's graduated to glory, are we? Uh, that person is in the presence of the Lord and, and receiving the benefits of a life lived for Him. But what would it have been like to meet God for the first time? Well, let's open to Genesis. And this is familiar territory. You're not going to see any new text here. This is all familiar stuff. But, but what was it like for mankind to meet God in the very beginning? So we know the scriptures begin with, the Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness is over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the waters. And the very first quote of God is, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you go to Harvard University, uh, on the main building, the floor you walk in, there is uh, the Harvard logo painted on the floor, and it says, Fiat Lux, uh, let there be light, in Latin. Moses, who we understand wrote the book of, of Genesis, was not there when God said, let there be light. This obviously was information that God revealed to Moses so that he could reveal it to us. Uh, the curtains of heaven are drawn back and we are in on the conversation of God speaking and what was not became. The power of God that just by his word the worlds were formed. This was not the first conversation that God ever had because God's an eternal being, and He's a triune being. And the Father, Son, and Spirit have had fellowship from before the foundation of the earth. And we have to believe that there was communication in whatever language God would have spoken. Um, I believe that God spoke uh, Hebrew when He was speaking to Adam, because Adam, the name that He gave him, uh, comes from the word for for earth, and earth is where he comes from. So it makes sense to me that Hebrew is what he spoke to Adam. But when he said, let there be light, via he or in, in Hebrew, were those actually the words that he spoke? Was it actually in Hebrew? We don't know. And it doesn't really matter. But the whole first chapter of Genesis is basically the overview of the days of creation, the six days of, of creation. Uh, the first blessing is when you get to verse 22, and it's already after God has created. The word tananim in, in Hebrew is variously translated in our Bibles, uh, sea monsters. It's also the word that's translated as dragon. We don't know exactly what a, a tanan was, but it's a large animal, uh, what, a beast. And that's the first thing that God mentions as, he, as he's blessing every living creature, the fish and the birds, God bless them in verse 22, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the first blessing is given to his creation, and particularly the animal kingdom. Then we get to verse 26, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Two key points that we see here. First of all, God says, let us make man in our image. In the image and likeness of God, we were created. Now, the Latin form for this is imago dei, and it is the primary reason why believers have had a concern for the sick, for the mentally handicapped, for those who are uh, in the furthest remote parts of the earth is the inherent value of humanity comes because of the fact 
that we are a reflection of, of God. We are created in His image, in a way that is above all the other creation. As God goes through the days of creation, the first six days, everything that he, he sees, when He is done, He says it's good or very good. It's, this is very good. He's satisfied, well satisfied with His, his creation. And when we stop to think that in the short span of time He speaks and the whole universe comes into existence, one of the things that strikes me is, as we've progressed in our abilities in the scientific world, both in the microscopic level and the telescopic, the macroscopic level, as we've sent out uh, spacecraft with the Hubble telescope and other exploratory instruments, uh, to even begin to understand the vastness of the universe that we inhabit. It's just mind-boggling. And then to think, that at the microscopic level, uh, the world is as immense as it is at the macroscopic level and in terms of um, what God has created at the subatomic level. And until recent years, scientists had no way of even measuring these things. We just knew that the world was great, but our understanding has grown to the fact that it's even greater still. And it's such an anomaly, is it not, that some of the greatest atheists are some of the greatest scientific minds. You would think there would be a, a humility, a, a bowing before the wisdom of the Creator. Uh, but that's not what we see too often in the scientific world. The first thing we see is that we're created in God's image, which means that we have intrinsic value. The second thing is that we were created to rule to rule over everything that God created, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle over all the earth, every creeping thing that's on the earth. Mankind is given dominion. And this is before he even creates, in verse 26, that he makes the, the blessing. In verse 27, he says, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And then in verse 28, bless them, and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, there it is. Mankind is supposed to subdue the earth and to rule over it. And in this sense, we are created to be God's instruments, His representatives here on earth. And when you understand that, it helps, I think, for us to understand why it is that mankind has been in Satan's crosshairs from the beginning. Because we are God image bearers, and because we are His representative rulers over the earth, mankind has great value to God, and because of that, because Satan can't punch God in the nose, whatever God especially loves, Satan especially hates, and so in order to diminish God's glory and to arrogate power for himself, mankind has been the one who he has attacked. So God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, evening and morning, the sixth day. I want to just briefly go to Psalm chapter 8 as a parallel uh, for us this morning. Again, a familiar chapter. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revenge will cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? Well, King James, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him or that you care for him, the New American Standard that I'm reading from this morning. Yet you have made him a little lower than, and if you've got a King James, it says, than the angels, right? We've got an English standard version. Uh, it says, then, the uh, heavenly beings. The New American standard says, you made him a little lower than God. Well, why do we have these diverse translations of the same Hebrew word? Well, the Hebrew word is the word Elohim. It's the same word that's been used in chapter 1 and chapter 2 to refer to the Creator. 
Elohim is the generic word for God, and it, it's in the plural form. Let us make man in our image. You know, is one of the reflections of the plurality of the unity of deity, right from Genesis chapter 1. Elohim, a plural form. So usually when the angels are referenced uh, in Scripture, it's B'nai Elohim, if you're talking about uh, the fact that they are the sons of God. Uh, the word angel is the word malach, which is the word for, for messenger. It's the one who is sent. But B'nai Elohim is also a term, the sons of God, is also used sometimes out of the angelic world, which is why I think King James translated, you made it a little lower than the angels, but it doesn't say B'nai Elohim here in uh, Genesis 2, it says Elohim. You've made it a little lower than Elohim, than, than God. In fact, you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, and then he lists some of those creatures, the created beings, that mankind is to rule over. So it's an echo of what we saw in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, God is, or Genesis 1, that we are made in his image and made to rule. Then we go to Genesis chapter 2. So flip back with me to, to Genesis again, and we'll look at chapter 2. You know, and those who scoff and scorn at the scripture say, well, this is an example of how we know that the Bible is just a compilation of myths and fables and folk tales. When Lori and I were privileged to live in Jerusalem back in the early 80s, I sat in a class at Hebrew University under a man named Abraham Malamat, who was a world-renowned scholar. In fact, I believe I passed a sign from Millican University on my way here. And I, I didn't know what Millican University was back in 1981 when I was sitting in the class. And uh, some professors from Millican University came and met Abraham Malamat. And you would have thought that uh, he was the Pope or something. They, they fawned over him like this was this was some superstar. And I realized, you know, I'm studying under a man who's been quoted by Time Magazine. In Time Magazine, uh, Malamat was quoted as saying, uh, there was no such person as Moses, but he had a brother named Moses. <laughs> Which is his way of saying, you know, there's some kernels of truth that are, are reflected in the Torah, especially, you know, in these early chapters we have. Uh, but as far as Malamat was concerned, real history, documentable history from the Bible doesn't really start until the time of King David, and even some of those stories are, are just myths and folk tales. But there really was a king named David. But Moses, he's not so sure of that. Well, myths and fables and fairy tales is not what the Bible is. It's the inspired word of God. And in chapter 1, we've got one account of creation, but in chapter 2, God has a different purpose, because here he's focused specifically on the creation of, of mankind. When he says in verse 7, the Lord formed, uh, Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In Genesis 1, it just says, uh, and he created male and female in, in his image, and told them to be fruitful and multiply. But now we're getting down to the day of creation, the time of creation, and the how of creation. That God takes dust of the earth, forms a man, and breathes life into him. That the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So we learn from Genesis 2, what we don't know in Genesis 1, is that man was created first, and apparently a little time passes because God actually creates an environment, a habitation space for Adam and places him in the Garden of Eden and says to him, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And that's a good translation, you will surely die. In the Hebrew it's actually a an emphasized reiteration of the form of the word to die. Dying, you will die. We might say in English, uh, a dead man, you'll be dying. 
that's the emphasis here. You are, you are going to die for sure if you eat of this. Verse 20 tells us, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. God looks around and he, he sees everything that he's made and it's good. But the first thing that he says is not good, uh, lo tov, instead of tov, is uh, it's not good for man to be alone. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned a woman from the rib which he had taken from the man. And God brought her to the man. And now we have the first wedding. And Adam is excited to have a woman who is suitable for him. And now man can fulfill the command to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth. The, the mandate to really to be lords of the earth, to have God's place of managing the ecosystem of this globe, uh, the planet earth that we call home. And then we get to chapter 3, of course, and we read about the serpent, who is more crafty than any beast. And he comes, and the first conversation that we have of... Uh, an animal with a man, or a woman in this case. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? He opens with a question. The first question that's recorded in Scripture is, did God really say? And Satan's been asking that question ever since, hasn't he? To get us to doubt the veracity of God's word. He always has a good substitute to offer us in his temptations. He said to the woman, indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from the tree of any, any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the tree, fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat it, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it nor touch it or you will die. And you know, commentators can really have a good time with this because God said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. And she says, God has said, don't eat it or touch it or you will die, right? And that's not what God told Adam, at least not as Moses recorded it. So where did she get this idea of touch it? Well, if we go back to Genesis 1, you see, God said it to Adam before Eve was created. So I can imagine that Adam was the one who was giving instruction to his wife, saying, hey, honey, you know, help yourself. Anything that looks good, just have at it. But, but there's this one tree, you know, if we eat them, God said we're going we're gonna to die. So don't even touch it. I can imagine that Adam's the guy that said, don't even touch it, don't you? Scripture doesn't say that's a surmise on the part of the preacher, so you can do with it as you want. But that's kind of how I, I think uh, she got the idea, don't even touch it. I think Adam said, uh, don't, don't, don't go near that one. Uh, but, this, but Satan says, You'll not, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Now think about this. We're already told in Scripture, we are created in God's image. And Satan recognizes in mankind that these are the rulers of the earth. These are the people God has entrusted to be sovereigns over this world. And Satan wants that power for himself, and he wants to diminish God's glory. And so... He says to, to her, well, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Well, guess what? We are already like God. We're intellect, emotion, and will. Right? The animals have some wonderful characteristics. And, you know, if you watch America's Got Talent or some of these shows where, you know, they train dogs or they train pigs or, you know, all kinds of animals can be trained to do all kinds of things. But it's a man or a woman who's who's training those animals to do those things. They don't inherently have those abilities. And, you know, you can teach a dog to speak, but the dog's going to say, Ruff! <laughs> He's not going to have a real conversation with you. Uh, you know, Lassie excluded, because, you know, Lassie could say Timmy was in the well, and everybody knew to run to the well to rescue, to rescue Timmy. But, but apart from Lassie and, you know, the snake and the garden and, and the donkey, uh, uh, who spoke to Balaam, we're not, we're not used to too many talking animals. <clears throat> minor birds and parrots who can, uh, who can mimic human speech. Well, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Yep, that's no, no doubt. 
It was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from the fruit and she ate. She made the mental calculation. There was a, a physical appeal and the temptation of the enemy. And the warning of God in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die, uh, takes a back seat. We could speculate what would it have been like if Adam and Eve had made it through without sinning. We'd still be living in the Garden of Eden today. I mean, counterfactuals speculating on what would have been if what happened didn't really happen. Uh, you could build all kinds of scenarios with the serpent that have come and tempted Cain and Abel. Uh, we don't know. But because of the sin of Eve and then Adam, of course, also participates. And Adam has the, the greater responsibility, according to the New Testament, because Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. The serpent did not tempt Adam. He participated in his wife's sin. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Well, the result of this is in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So now, instead of sweet fellowship with their creator, Adam and Eve are hiding from God. I want to go back to that time when God created man from the dust of the earth, and he breathes life into him. You know, any time we make a movie out of a biblical story, you're going to have to add material because the Bible is sparse on details in a lot of areas. If you wanted to know what was Adam's reaction when he first blinked his eyes open, God created an adult male, and now he's a living being. And I can imagine that when his eyes first opened, the first thing that he would have seen would have been his creator. And we can discuss what form would God have appeared to him in, because the scripture says that no man has seen God at any time. And when Moses wants God to reveal himself, God says, no one can see me in life. And yet, the Bible is replete with stories of God having interchange with humanity. And this is one of those in Genesis 3, when God comes to walk in the garden in the cool of the day, as was his custom. And Adam and Eve were meeting with him. I think all of these Old Testament examples of people meeting God, Genesis 18, when, when um, Abraham is sitting in his tent in the heat of the day, he sees three men coming. But the text says, and the Lord appeared to Abraham. Three men show up. And God speaks to him. And two of those men go off to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're identified as angelic beings. These are all examples of God appearing in a pre-incarnate form, human form. I think it's God the Son who is uh, manifesting himself, who is, who is visible. And from Colossians chapter 1, we know that the Lord Jesus was the active one in creation. The Father and the Spirit are both referenced. Uh, the Lord is the, is the creator. Uh, the Lord God is often one of the terms for the Lord Jesus. I believe it could well have been God the Son who was forming Adam and breathing life into him, and that would have been the first face that Adam saw. How much Wisdom was hardwired into Adam at creation. The ability to speak. Adam didn't have to learn how to speak. The ability to think and to think 
concretely and broadly. He named every animal. This idea that man evolved from apes and came into a caveman existence, you know, the Neanderthal and all this, is absolutely contrary to what Adam's capabilities were. The first man had an amazing brain, capacity to do all kinds of things. <clears throat> Who's the most famous person that you've ever had an audience with? I've been in the same room or in the same place as the Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States, but I didn't have an audience with them. I saw them, they saw me, well, Reagan waved at me from a car as he was going down the road in Chicago. I didn't have an audience with them. But I can imagine if I had an invitation to the Oval Office, I give some thought to what it would be like to meet the President of the United States. It wasn't just a, a random passing, but I actually had an appointment. Prepare to meet your God. Well, who is this God that we're going to meet? Well, he introduces himself to us as the creator of everything that is. He is the supreme and all-powerful creator. He's the wise God, the only wise God, the scripture tells us. And he is a holy God, and he reveals himself as a God who is going to judge sin. With our first parents, the warning was given, the consequence was clear, they sinned. Did they die immediately? Well, yes and no. They didn't die physically immediately, but they began to die physically immediately. The curse of death was immediately applied. <coughs> My brother, when he was in his 40s, uh, maybe he was still in his 30s, he got colon cancer. But they found it really quickly, and they removed it so quickly that he didn't even require radiation or, or chemotherapy. Well, we were talking about the fact that you know cancer is a killer. And I said, well, you know, but actually, you know, I, I've got a terminal disease. And he said, well, what do you have? I said, well, it's sin. Sin is a terminal disease, and it's 100% mortality rate. We are born to die. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so all of us are under the curse of death. God's going to give man 120 years here in these early generations. Later on, he's going to say three score and ten, and if by strength four score, and after that we, we fly away. If you live to 80, you've lived a, a ripe old age. But none of us are, are promised tomorrow. And prepare to meet your God is a message for everyone every day. Because who knows? Since I've bought a motorcycle, I haven't had a motorcycle since I was in college. So a lot of decades have gone by since I climbed on a bike. And I actually went and took a motorcycle riding class to make sure that A, I still loved it, but more importantly, that I could handle a bike. Because, you know, there's a reason they call them donor cycles. Have you heard that expression? So I don't think I'm ever more aware of my mortality than when I climb on two wheels and head out for the highway. But the truth of us, the truth of it is that the Lord could come today and all of us would be in his presence. Or today might be the day that he calls any of us home individually. Back to Genesis chapter 2. God clearly said, don't eat or you will die. They began to die physically, but they did die spiritually. And it's reflected in the fact that the personal relationship that they had enjoyed with God in the garden up to that point is now damaged. And you notice that mankind is the one who's hiding from God. It's not that God says, I'm so done with you. He could have destroyed Adam and Eve and started all over again. If perfection was what he indeed 
designed for the universe that he could have nipped it in the bud immediately, killed the snake, and killed Adam and Eve and started all over again. But you know, God's grace and his mercy are only reflected because of sinful rebellion. It's only because Adam and Eve sinned that we see that grace is applied. And so when you get to the point of Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, God shows up. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Prepare to meet thy God. Here's the first meeting of God with sinful mankind. Rebels who knew what was restricted from them, what was prohibited, and they did it anyway. What would you expect the first words of a righteous, holy God to be? You could fill in the blank with all kinds of things, but I don't know that where are you would have been the first words that I would have thought. Well, God never asks a question for which he does not have the answer, right? <laughs> God knows everything, so he's not going to learn anything by saying, where are you? I think God knew exactly the species of the tree that Adam was hiding behind. Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Notice, he doesn't say, I was afraid because I'm a sinful man, and you're a righteous God. But that's really what he's saying. I now understand that I'm naked. They're naked and ashamed. Well, they were naked before, but they weren't ashamed before because they weren't sinners before. And so this is we see what we, what we lost in the fall. Created in the image of God. Created to be rulers over the earth. Created to be his representatives to a watching world and to the angelic beings. And to the angelic beings. The angels are watching human history unfold. And they're very interested. Both the holy angels who are on God's side and the third of the angels that fell with Satan in his rebellion. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? God's first three statements are questions. And Adam says, well, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, fourth question, what is this that you have done? And she said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then we have the curse of God against the serpent, which includes the first proto-messianic promise. Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the heel. There it is. Uh, in theological terms, they call this the proto-evangelium. The first gospel. This is the promise that a descendant of mankind, someone who's going to be descendant of Adam and Eve, is going to be the one who's going to bruise Satan on the head. And of course, that is the Lord Jesus, the descendant of Abraham and David through the line of Adam. To the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply your pain. There are consequences immediately here on earth. Pain in childbirth. Your husband's going to rule over you. And then Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, about which I commanded, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. You will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread until you return to the ground. So there it is. Yes, you are dying. I told you you were going to die, and yes, you are already dying. You're going to return to the ground. You were taken from the dust, and the dust you shall return. And we echo that in funerals all the time. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, a man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. We're created in his image, but now we're more like God because 
we know, experientially we know evil. God doesn't experience evil, right? God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. It's impossible for God to sin. So in the one way, we know something God does not. God knows evil intellectually, we may say, but we know it experientially. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. There was still the possibility that dying you will die would not be fulfilled if they went and ate of the tree. You know, you can think of this as a curse because God uh, sent him out of the garden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out at the east of the garden of Eden. He stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Right? To be kicked out of the garden was definitely a curse. But honestly, folks, think about it. If Adam had been given access to the tree of life and was able to live together as a, as a sinful man, you know, that in itself would have been a curse. It was a, it was a blessing of God to keep him away from life everlasting in a sinful state. And as much as we don't look forward to death, I don't know anybody who says, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to die. You know, we ought not to sorrow as those who have no hope. The fact that we put off the mortal to put on immortality. I'm looking forward to a glorified body. I don't have all the aches and pains of age yet, but I'm getting more of them with each passing decade. I'm looking forward to having a glorified body. But, but far more than that, it's to be back in the Garden of Eden pre-fall before sin entered the world, and, and death by sin, and not just physical death, but, but the spiritual death. Can you imagine what it would be like to have the pure innocence of Adam and Eve before sin? We, we look at an infant and we say, well, you know, they're as innocent as a babe. And it's true that they haven't overtly sinned when they're so cute, just kind of struggling in a cradle. But the sin nature is already inside of them. And, when we were living in Jerusalem, the Lord was making cookies. Uh, Josh might have been four years old. You know, so chocolate chip cookies, holy chocolate chip cookies in, in Israel was a, was a treat for us. And you walk into the kitchen, and here's Josh, who was four or five years old. Uh, I think it was even before then. I think it was a three-year-old. Josh. He's got crumbs around his, his mouth. He's got chocolate on <coughs> his fingertips. Josh, did, did you eat a cookie before dinner when Mom said those are for dessert? I and mean, what do you suppose Josh said? No. Oh, you know, I only get one son. I've got three girls. Josh is the firstborn. Three beautiful daughters. Um, but I only got one son. And, and if I could choose any kid to be my son, I would choose Josh. He's a pediatric nurse at Rush Hospital today. And, uh, He's beloved by his co-workers, and everybody loves Josh. He's a great kid, and he's a godly, a godly young man. But yeah, he said, no, Dad, I didn't eat the cookie. Now, you have to believe that neither Lori nor I sat down with Josh and said, well, let us teach you how to prevaricate. Right? When you're in trouble, here's how you twist the truth to your advantage. You have to believe that we never did that. But sin is bound up in the heart of a child. And to graduate to glory doesn't just mean to leave behind the world and its woes. You know, there's no COVID-19, there are no riots in the streets, there's no insurrection against governments, there's no crime. We don't have to worry about defunding the police, we're not going to need the police in the world to come. but the wonder of being transported into a perfect place to be able to have that intimate fellowship with God face to face, to know Him as we are known, to not be hiding because of our sinfulness. God knows our sinfulness. He knows it from the inside out. But the righteousness of Christ through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross has cleansed every stain of sin and more than just a stain remover, the Lord Jesus has draped us with the robe of righteousness so that when we stand before the judge of all the earth, he not only is not going to see my sin, but he's going to see the righteousness, the complete righteousness 
of the sinless Son of God. That's what grace and mercy have won for us. And to live, yes, with everlasting life, with not only no fear of death, but disease and all that wrecks and ruins this world will be totally erased. And boy, that ought to give us some comfort and encouragement in the world in which we live, should it not? We can spend a lot of time wringing our hands about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but you know, God has a timer set for this world, and there is coming a day when all things are going to be made new. And until that time, let's remember a couple of things. First of all, let's remember that we are created in God's image. We are created in God's image. And that's not a means for, of arrogance for us, but what it tells us is that humanity, including those who are anti-God, and I think this is a message the church really needs to hear, because I see on Facebook, you know, the animosity which is growing and the division in our country, you know, it's not just on one side moving away, it's also on, on the side of people who claim righteousness, who are filled with anger and hatred and vitriol against the people who are standing in the way of the enemy's path. But look, God had grace and mercy on Adam and Eve. He came to them, sought them out in the garden, and we're his representatives here on this earth. And I believe that one of the challenges that the church has today is whether it's here in Manchester or in the major cities like Chicago and, and New York and Los Angeles, Seattle and Portland, or to the ends of the earth, that God's love needs to be extended through us, through believers, to the most unlovely, to the most hateful. And Jesus told us what we're supposed to do to those who persecute us and who curse us and the blessing that comes when we bless and curse not. And so if you examine your own heart today, and maybe you're one of those who's praying for those who are in opposition, and you're praying for those in our government who are taking positions that you wouldn't support. Um, it's one thing to pray for the imprecatory prayers of God's judgment upon those people. Those are easy to pray. But to pray for God's mercy and grace to be extended to them, as it was to Adam and Eve in the garden, and as it was to you and me, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were rebels running away, and he came and chased us down, just as he did for Adam and Eve in the garden. So I think that's an important application point for us. And secondly, to be reminded that as God's, as God's representatives here on earth, it matters how we live. Um, our attitudes and actions reflect who he is. Uh, I, I want the light of the Lord to shine through my life. And I don't know of any way to do that, uh, because trying harder to do better has not worked for me. And a lot of messages that I've heard over the years, and sadly, many that I preached early in my ministry, I think the takeaway for most folks was, well, Wes thinks we've got to try harder to do better. But I've tried harder to do better, you know, and I've had very limited success in sustaining that. You know, it's sort of like saying, I'm, I'm I'm going to go on a diet, so I'll skip a cupcake, you know, this afternoon, but tonight I'm going to have some of that apple salad with Snickers in it, you know? <laughs> it's not trying harder to do better. I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. It's that exchange life that we really need to be living. And to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is the one who, who dwells within us. So the very power of God to live the life of righteousness that he calls us to Adam and Eve didn't have that in the garden, but you and I do today. There's no substitute for being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And I think that's the biggest takeaway for all of us. Because when we walk in the Spirit, not only do we not fulfill the desires of the flesh, but we can be that representative here on earth that God intended and designed for us to be. So those are my takeaways for us this morning. Speaking primarily to myself, but if there's something that's here from God's Word that He's spoken to you with, and I pray that this week uh, he'll help you to apply that. Let's pray. Father, there, there's so much in your word to unpack, and I feel like there's, there are nuggets and kernels of truth that we just so lightly skipped over here. But Lord, you're our teacher, and so we ask that you would uh, apply the truths of your word to each heart who's listening today. Make us more like Jesus. We we're created in your image. And that is something that we inherited. 
but the process of sanctification is something that we willingly participate in as we yield, as we humble ourselves before you, and we allow you to live your life through us. So thank you for the gift of salvation, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking up residence within us. Thank you, Father, for your word, which endures forever and instructs us. And may the triune God continue to have your ministry in each of our lives so that we may bring you the greatest glory, uh, not only here on earth, but in the eternity to follow. And we'll give you thanks. In Yeshua's name, even Jesus our Savior.